Yeah, yeah, but, th but there's very few Alan Hall. Yeah, that very looks very all right for you. So we're going to have to pull this. Yeah. Okay. I believe it's right here. Oh, great. Oh, great. Oh, great. Oh, great. And I'll talk to you. Uh, talk to you. Uh, Herman. Uh, if you want to, you know, find nice. every spaghetti dinner for 10 uh, hours. Thank you very much. No problem. I think, you know, I can bounce it into a district and really don't like it. Yeah, we'll start with that. All right. got people like you doing it.
Keith is a member of our foundation board and a fantastic advocate for public education. So um, at this time, I'd like to turn the time over to them. They can um, give us the information uh, that they have. I would like to say um, on Tuesday of this week, we had the opportunity of attending Roy High School with the governor and seeing the results of Prosperity 2020 in our school district, it was tremendous. It was just an outstanding opportunity to see how those that are willing to get together and to work uh, together for a goal, you can accomplish anything. And so I'll turn the time over to um, to John and Keith. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. I guess this will work if I stand up here. Uh, as I've been introduced, my name is John Pitt, and I'm actually with the Salt Lake Chamber. Uh, my responsibility with the Salt Lake Chamber is to coordinate Prosperity 2020. And as Dean explained, and I appreciate that great introduction, uh, we are a, a coalition of businesses that uh, not only within the Salt Lake Chamber, but 40 additional chambers throughout the state have, uh, have signed on to our Prosperity Through Education program and are also supporting education in their communities from, from Tremont to St. George, from Vernal to Delta. You know, we, we cover the entire state to bring business in line with what's going on uh, at you in your classrooms, with your school board, etc., and to help out where we can. Uh, I should mention that I've been involved with uh, uh, the Weaver and with the, and with the Davis County Chambers as well. And I think probably my greatest qualification to be here today is I am the husband of a sixth grade teacher. So I hear your pain, I understand what you do, and I know the work that goes on and the great things that happen. Uh, in the public schools throughout Utah, and that's why I was excited to have the opportunity to work with this program through the Salt Lake Chamber. What I would like to do is sort of just take a, an idea and work through some of the business side of things, and then when we shift to the education-specific things, I'm going to turn it over to Keith Buswell, who's a great supporter of ours. Uh, he's the acting chair of Prosperity 2020 and has been a great help. We've toured the state together to be on to many of these presentations. I know that all of you know him as well, so I'll, uh, I'll hurry through this and, and let you, uh, give you a chance to hear from him. The first thing that I want to do is, is explain why business is involved. Now, in the case of Keith Buswell, you know, it's, a, it's an inherent love, it's a great community service, but with businesses, there's also the bottom line to worry about. Every business is, checking, is thinking about its bottom line, as are the chamber members, and they have found that education is the best place to invest money in order to ensure that that bottom line for business and therefore the community at large continues to grow. So I just want to quickly review through some of the good news of things that's going on here in Utah. You may have heard year after year that Utah has been named uh, the number one state for business six of the past seven years. Uh, we've, Forbes is probably the best known uh, magazine that has named Utah to an honor like that. We received others just the other day. So we continue to be acknowledged for the diversity and the success of our economy. Uh, the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has named us the number one state for economic dynamism, dynamism um, which means we're, we've got a lot of variety. We're not entirely dependent on oil, as some states are, so when that market tanks, we, we're, not, you know, we're not left at the bottom. We can continue to depend on, on uh, military, high-tech, each of the different seven industries that the governor has put into clusters, we're working with each of those through the chambers to build a support for education. Uh, the Pew Charitable Trust named us the number two state for economic growth. Just uh, another uh, outlook into the future. However, with all that great things going on, there's some news that's not so terrific. Uh, education Week named Utah the 38th best place to educate our children. So you're all teachers, you know that uh, 38, that, that's, a, that's an F. This is the one that uh, a lot of us are aware of. The U.S. Census Bureau named Utah the 51st best funded state for education. 51st, you say, well, that's because Puerto Rico ranks above us in the, in the amount of money that is spent per student. 
Um, a lot of folks say throwing money at the at this situation is not going to guarantee that it fixes it. No, we agree with that. But when you're when you're dead last, it will certainly help. And uh, those are some of the things that uh, we're trying to do through education uh, and the business partnerships. You recognize Ben Franklin there. Uh, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. As I mentioned earlier, investment in education has an eight to one return uh, to the economy in the, in the form of better paying jobs, uh, work, that's, the work that can be done, et cetera, uh, throughout the state. As you have the opportunity to hear about businesses coming into Utah, you need to recognize that they're doing that in spite of the outlook that we have right now of the education funding. And, and for many companies that you don't hear about are the ones who say, well, oh, we're not so certain that Utah is where we want to go and invest and, and have our other people from around the country move here uh, if, they're, if the education that they're going to receive is in question. We know here in Utah that Utah teachers are able to leverage the money they receive and have terrific results. Utah has ranked very highly, but those results, as you may know, are also declining in, the, in comparison to the other states. So that's, that's our cue to go to work and to bring business in to support you. To talk now specifically about some of the things that we've done in the past legislative session and some of the things that we've looked to moving forward as we round out this decade. Prosperity 2020 means these are the things you want to have done now in just about three and a half years. Okay, you want this?
uh, this end product of what these kids are going to be and opportunities for them in uh, Utah. Uh, and I just say that the business community has a different voice on the Hill than the educators. So many of the legislators see any educator that shows up, got your hand out, give us more money. Uh, or the business community shows up and said, we need results. We want, to, if we want to attract business, one of the first questions these businesses as they come is, do I want to relocate my children and my employees' children to come to Utah to be educated? And there's some issues that are, are challenging. Uh, but they love the quality of life. They love the work ethic in Utah. And there's great opportunities. I mean, Utah really is a sterling uh, example of what business ought to be across the country. Uh, and I think that uh, it, I, as I thought about what you mentioned with the governor coming and talking about the Roy Cohn, it made me think of something. My uh, wonderful grandfather, Merwin Thompson, a good dairy farmer from Plain City, when I turned 80 years old, he gave me a little plaque. And on this plaque was a picture of an acorn and an oak tree. And he said, and the plaque said to me, uh, just remember the mighty oak was once a nut like you. Uh, but the lesson there is, out of small things, proceed at that, which is great. And tonight, right now, we're going to be talking about kind of two things. The Roy Cohn concept is so exciting. And from my experience at the State School Board, I wish we had that in place a few years ago. Because in some regards, it's a small idea with huge impact. Now, it took me, it takes money, it takes effort, but it's it's really not the biggest thing in the world. It's let's do local things, let's go, and uh, let's go knock on the doors of the students that aren't here. Because if they don't graduate, it's because they don't come to school. And the, the efforts and whatever have been out there has just been incredible. Then I have the older students, tutor the younger students, have the boys club, or the girls club, and the community involved with the businesses. It's just a wonderful example. But then I would say the other side is, uh, one of the challenges that I've seen is that the legislators, uh, bless their hearts with a thousand bills or whatever, and Janice could probably tell me how many bills there are every year, but uh, education-wise it may be 250 bills. A lot of those bills uh, are passed in the state school board and local school boards never had any engagement in that. Then those things get passed and then they have to implement them. The state school board and how that impacts the, the local school board or, and the school districts are tough. Um, but as we think the, the, the coalition of the business community with the education, higher ed as well as secondary, talk together and say, what are we going to do with this process to be able to make it happen? Um, and I just tell you that uh, we've seen some great things happen. And when I do this, so the big idea is we're going to talk a little bit about how we need to find some more money. And as we look at the big idea, again, as I think about on uh, my experience at the local school board and the state school board, if you're one year at a time, one bill at a time, and you're trying to do this stuff versus where are we going to really have a plan in transportation in Utah, you know, develop a 10-year, 15-year plan. Well, where's our education plan that way? Envision Utah has surveyed over 50,000 uh, people in Utah got their feelings about education. So we're trying to hold it down. And Prosperity 2020, along with, pros uh, with Education First, have went to the legislators and really said, let's, let's focus on some specific outcomes. And so I'd like to just talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we've seen. Our, our plan really has four simple goals. The first one, the reading goal, is that Utah will rank among the top 10 states for fourth and eighth grade reading. Again, that being the top 10, and some of you are a little closer than that to be able to see, but fourth grade uh, now is 14th among the states. And the goal for math, we're at the 10%, but we'd like to increase that. The math goal, Utah will rank among the top 10 states for the fourth and eighth grade math. <coughs> right now, uh, in the fourth grade, we're 20th among the states. And then regarding the eighth grade, we're 16th. We have work to do there. Then the graduation goal, Utah will rank among the top 10 states for high school graduation rate. 
And we're in 2012, 25th among those states. And so we have a ways there. And then regarding higher education, Utah will rank among the top 10 states for percentage of adults with a post-secondary certificate or degree. And we know that any post-secondary degree, it may be a welding certificate, opens up more doors than not having that. And so it's not like everyone has to get a PhD to go, but the postgraduate, they can be again with the ATCs, uh, junior college, uh, associate's degrees, uh, bachelor's degrees, and have some skills and some certificates to make a big difference. Okay, so let's go to the next one. And, and I won't go through all of these. Uh, some of you will be uh, well versed on these various bills. But this past session, the education funding with the efforts, uh, not just our efforts, but the collective efforts of those in the education community and the legislators in Prosperity 2020, that really have funded $432 million. And the very first thing, we've got to fund growth. And when I sat at the school board, the state school board, it was like, like, oh, well, let's see, where should that be this year, third or fourth? I think, yeah, that's got to be above the line. You've got to start there. There's new kids, you've got to fund those kids. That shouldn't be a priority. That's just got to be a given. Uh, so going through that, the WPU increase, uh, the concurrent enrollment, and I can just tell you that it's great to see higher education working on how uh, the staffable credentials, working on some things. When we are doing things at the uh, high school level, it's going to pay off uh, for students and being able to save time, be more effective in, as they get into the higher education. Uh, down the SB67 partnership for six, uh, student success, that's really the bill associated with the Roy Cole. And uh, Ann Milner uh, had a lot to do with uh, making that happen. Uh, but to be able to say, here's some money, let's go find school districts that can all buy in to be able to say, let's, let's put our arms around these students. And, and make it work. The next page has, again, some other uh, readiness, the workforce, uh, and some amendments to the uh, trust lands amendments there. Now, as we go, uh, one of the things we just need to also understand, since 1995, with the cuts that have happened in <coughs> education, so we're talking about needing more money, but most people don't know what has been lost since 1995. You look at the individual income tax credits or cuts, the tax revisions, other funds siphoned to go to other areas, and again, that may have been transportation, but almost a billion dollars away from education since 1995. That hurts. That's a painful thing. So we go to the next one. Uh, we've had conversation with President uh, Niederhauser and you'll see Education First has presented us with a visionary initiative and the legislative now, legislature now needs to do a deep dive into the possibilities. I'm committed to work over the interim to determine the best path forward on our public education investment. Some of you have heard of the 7-8 tax initiative. And as we look at this, um, this, this is a big idea. This may not be the only idea of how to fund uh, there's some other mechanisms that can happen. But as we've gone through what this would mean to each of the schools in the Weber district, and you'll see numbers of students, the per student, and uh, the total funds. But as we go through that, you can, if we could kind of just screen a little bit slow, but you can kind of see some of you, I heard someone was saying they were from Majestic, you can kind of see what that would mean. And uh, when we were talking up in Brigham City, one of the local elementary school principals was there and just got so excited to think of what he could do with $600,000 or something in his school. Uh, and as we go to the total uh, opportunity, just through this process, is about $25 million to Weaver School District schools, over $25. Uh, so you look at that, and, and again, we're, we're taxpayers, so we're not saying we love tax increases. But if we just look one year at a time, and where money's going to come from, we're missing it. And, the, and the, uh, through Envision Utah and other surveys and things, 
people that in the taxpayer of the state of Utah say for education, we're willing to make some investments. You know, it may be uh, so many eighty dollars or uh, more a year or whatever. I, I don't. I'm not giving you the number, but but it's that comes whatever. Now there's other mechanisms. Uh, Pat Jones a couple of years ago had a uh, process that she was looking at some things that uh, provided some other uh, different uh, mechanisms. Uh, and all of you know about the trust lands. There, there's money there. Can we pull some of that out and still maintain the trust and let that grow? So, uh, what's the last one there? Or is that that's it? Right. That's the that's the total page three. So, is there any questions first? Okay. Uh, seven eight. So that means seven eight. One percent. Yeah, income tax. Right. Seven eight. Seven eight of one percent. Uh, and that's kind of but again that was. We really were prepared to go get signatures and push that this last legislature. And uh, the Senate, uh, the President said, let's give us some time, let's see what we can do. We, we, we know we need to do something different. And so that's kind of the process of where we've got. Uh, so let me just conclude. Um, I would say a challenge to all of us, if uh, you're not reading a book uh, right now, I encourage you to go to the book mobile, get a good book. Uh, if you haven't read a book to a child recently, I can tell you to read a book to a kid. If you don't have a kid, borrow one or rent one. We all need to do it. It's been said that no man's mind after being stretched by a new idea can return to its original dimension. And as adults, and as educators and business people, we need to make sure we're stretching our minds uh, with technology and other things. We're the ones that will be left behind. So we better improve our education and our thirst for knowledge. And we appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight. If you have any other questions, we'd have to answer those. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Gosh, 2020 is a good example of getting together with some of the the best minds in the in the state, and trying to come up with something that works. And uh, the program at Troy High is a really good example of something that some some people who really wanted to see something work sat down and talked and went to some people, and when that didn't work, they looked a little further, and they didn't give up. And because of that, the, the uh, graduation rate at Weaver High School reached 98% from the 70s, the low 70s. So it's a great example of how, if we all work together, we can accomplish Great things. Thanks again, Keith, for telling me. Just want to let you know we, we have a few books here. The board all have them. This is the Prosperity for Education. We, we showed you the four simple goals that we're trying to get. That they're very boiled down. This is a point by point guide to how you know we can get get there. Um, this is, and I don't want to do a bunch of hardware store owners telling you how to educate kids. <laughs> it's much more than that. We uh, you know we, we check with lots of different consultants. We, did a lot of, you know, I paid significant amounts of money to have the research done to, uh, to focus in on the early education programs that are going to impact those graduation rates, starting at preschool, uh, areas of families at risk, et cetera, working with intergenerational poverty so that we've got a long-ranging plan in place to achieve those goals uh, in the time frame that we set. So we won't be talking about these very many years. Oh, Janice has a comment. This is Jessica. I can't help but interject. It's exciting to see this presentation. But as I say, when we talk about the WPU being increased in the state, I want you to know the legislature struggles so hard. My husband, who deals with the Health and Human Services, said that if, you know, a, a big push has been for Medicaid expansion, 
He said last year if we would have expanded to the degree that we were pushing for, there would have been no increase on, on the WPU in 20 programs that provide services to people would not would have been cut. So I think I watch business administrator Peterson here and the marvelous job he does with balancing. And I think the legislature is often seen as these greedy typists, but we only give them so much money, and that's what Alan said. You know, if we had done that, there would be no increase to education. So, it's a balance. Right, right. And the reason I think that working with the business community is so essential is that the, the solution to that, because everybody needs more than a bit of data in their time, as you said, you're fully aware of that. Um, through the business growth and economic development, we have the opportunity to grow the pot. There, there's a larger percentage of the, the spread around whatever the programs that may be. Um, and and our, our emphasis is then to, to, to you know, focus on education first right. as the best and most successful route to growing that economic pie overall, therefore giving it a state better resources to fund any number of things, whether it's health care, growth, all of which are tremendously easy, and we're aware of that. And, and, and having business folks like, like Keith and others come up to the, uh, to the committees and the legislators and the paper party and say, you know, this is not just a matter of strategic money or money. This is, you know, my company, which is building buildings all around, you know, the, the, the nation needs engineers. We need designers. We need computer programmers. And, and we've got to have them be better prepared than Utah. That, that's the approach that gets the legislators aware of where the priorities are. Well, thank you so much. It's very, very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. We'll move on now on the agenda to the action items. Um, I'd like to turn the time over to Robert. Robert. <laughs> The ratification of the negotiated agreements. Thank you, Dean. Um, we finished our negotiations process with the three employee groups that we negotiated with, the teachers, the classified employees, and the administrators. And I want to report it all went smoothly. Uh, Kevin isn't here tonight, but Kevin's our spokesperson, and he is really here. He has a way about him that he's able to, to, to press our needs without being demeaning or putting down others, and uh, we have a great working relationship right now with our employee groups. And uh, we've had the three uh, agreements, the highlights of the three agreements in your packet. Uh, are there any questions that we might ask? Uh, just so you know, the big money items were a 204% base increase, a, uh, a uh, our taking the share of uh, insurance increase, Insurance went up by about 10%. And we're taking our share of it, so the employees will also get an increase there on insurance premium. And also fully funding steps and lines uh, and increments. And then each of the employee groups had smaller things, a lot of related to language, cleaning up language, clarifying maternity leaves and F uh, FMLA, you know, leave, that's not only that we can act, those kinds of things. But for the most part, the big money items were well received and our employees, they, they've all ratified it in their respective groups. And now the board has to ratify it and so we can move forward. So I ask to be that, that, uh, that the motion be made to approve the employee agreements in three groups and that and, and, and we can move forward and set up our payrolls for the coming year. Thank you, Commander. Do I have a motion to approve the negotiated settlements? Been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Those in favor? Those opposed? Thanks for all those involved. The, the motion passes. Um, thanks to all those involved in the process, to the teachers, the classified employees, the administrators. There's a lot that goes in to uh, those negotiations and things that uh, we need to 
health teachers and classified workers and administrators. Uh, many things are, are thought about and worked on and we appreciate all the work. Um, once again, Robert, approval of the final budget for the school year just completed. Yeah, I'm just going to get started and we can get this going. Um, in the packet, the, the, what I've got in my presentation is on the first uh, five pages, and I just want to quickly review through that. These show you some of the highlights of the budget and kind of where we've been and what we estimate we're going to do. Um, on that first page, the top says revenue. And this has been very helpful. This is my third year doing this. The board has has like this data because it gives you a sense of where we get our money from. If you look at the m and revenue, that's our main fund, um, there's a column that says local, a column that says state, and a column that says federal. On the m and fund revenues, the local is 24 million or 29,000 and 13 percent of our funding is local. State is 149 million, 295,000. 80% of our funding comes from the state. That's why these things that occur with the state legislature are very important. Um, uh, and then uh, federal accounts for 6.5% of our total revenue um, at 12939000 That's in our m and general fund. So basically the story there is state revenue is key to our funding of our district. Uh, and the others are important too. We'd be at a serious loss if we didn't have those local and federal dollars as well. Um, school board food services, if you jump down there rather than just going through the numbers, you can see that they're dominated by the federal dollars. 52% of all revenue for school food services is federal. And uh, sales to students account for almost four million. That's three million eight hundred ninety thousand. And then the state liquor fees that we get. And so a lot of people don't know that, but all the proceeds from the state liquor sales go to child nutrition. Um, uh, so, Cammy, when you go to the liquor store, you get you help <laughs> our school foods. Don't remember that. <laughs> you remember Thanks. that. Okay, <laughs> um, uh, Capital Alley Fund. Capital Alley Fund is almost all local. Uh, and I wanted to highlight that by my red pointer, I would. You can see we received thirty thousand three hundred forty-three dollars last year in state funds. That used to be two and a half to three million. And uh, one of the reasons we are adjusting or proposing an adjustment in the tax raise is because we want to get back into the state aid because our effort has fallen way low. Another thing you can see on that capital outlay fund is twenty-one million 
uh, 450,000, that was bond proceeds. We issued bonds of 20 million, and we had 1,450,000 in, uh, in, um, in extra monies that come with the bond sale, okay? Uh, now down to student activity fund. This is what funds our schools and their activities out there. Um, 6.2 million, that's all local. The foundation, last year we were required to put the foundation, they used to be a component unit, we were required to put them into our main budget, even though they are accounted for on their own books and they have their own auditors, we are also required to include them in on our main budget. Their revenue was almost 1.2 million, that's all local. And then debt service, that's what we pay our bonds with, that is 11,490,000 on the revenue and that's all local. So the bottom line there, when you put all those funds that rely on local dollars, we're almost 60% still of state funds, 32% local, and 7.5% federal. Once again, the state still dominates. Okay, that's that sheet on the revenue. Um, let's get out to uh, the next sheet, which is um, uh, expenses. On our expenses, uh, in the m and fund, this is why our relationship with our employee associations is so critical, is compensation dominates our funding. We really are a people organization. Uh, you can see there that 71%, almost 72% of our m and expenses are, in, are with instruction. Support services, that's primarily counseling and media services, is 3.6%. The school administration, that's our principals out of schools and all the office staffs in our schools is 6.5%, so all the secretaries and aides that help in our offices. District administration is 2%. Uh, this is uh, uh, not as large as some in the taxpayer community would think. Um, uh, the central services, which include finance, tech, and some other miscellaneous services, is 2.6%, maintenance of custodial is 9.7%, and transportation is 4% of the total expenses. Now look at the compensation, we'll just jump to the bottom. 90% of m and expenses are compensation. So that's huge, that we really are a people organization. And non-compensation uh, is, is the rest of that. Now school food services, you jump down to there, their compensation is less than 50%, because so much is spent on product, food, that's their biggest expense. And so their non-compensation is uh, almost, is over 7.1 million. The capital outlay fund, once again, compensation is very low there. And the non-compensation is on buildings, primarily uh, buildings, some buses we bought, we, we started a, um, a, a, a textbook a, adoption, uh, but the biggest bulk of that 27 million is on new construction. Uh, student activity fund, uh, once again, comp non-compensation is very small, uh, or I mean, very, uh, compensation is very small, non-compensation is in over 92%. The foundation, the compensation is very small, that's basically the staff that helps operate the foundation, the director and secretaries, and the non-compensation is big, 85%. Debt service is all non-compensation, so the total all funds is 70% compensation, 20% non-com. Um, the big takeaway there for me is that we, construction, our instruction is our bread and butter. We spend the most, by far, there's no nothing in the second, uh, second place is even close on instruction and compensation. We are a people, people organization. Okay, let's go to the next page, um, which is projected fund balances. Um, we have our fund balances from 2015, and you can see on the general fund, we ended the year with a $33,644,000 uh, fund balance. The debt service, we ended the year with a 1.7 million, capital, 18.5 million, and other, that includes the uh, student activity fund, the foundation, and child nutrition at 9,420,000. So a total combined fund balance of 63 million on July, one of 2015, we had 63 million in our coffers. Um, what's going to happen this year? 
This year, we see steady growth in debt service. The capital balances will plummet because our building's coming to a close. We're almost done with Birch Creek Elementary. A lot of money has been spent on um, uh, will on uh, on uh, uh, the new project out at, uh, at North Auburn Junior. We will end the year somewhere between six and eight million dollars, and I I just plucked six in there. Um, uh, on the general fund, which is the one we watch most carefully, uh, we're going to drop, and the reason being is because we have been transferring monies from the item line item called programs to help with our capital needs um, uh, uh, with education programs like WIC, the, the funding of that, and then also monies will be transferred there to help with uh, new construction. Um, where are we going to land really is in the unassigned. Our unassigned is going to go up by about 800000 I project, maybe pushing a million if my conservative projections hold. Um, uh, but we expect to see a good little jump in our unassigned on the fund balance there. Uh, that's kind of where we're projecting the end of the year. And then you can see the changes, the changes down below. Okay, We're in a healthy position board. Um, uh, steady as she goes, we're not uh, raising uh, money or uh, balances by uh, massive amounts. We're pretty much spending what we take in with, uh, with cushion and despair. Uh, okay, the next sheet is the, it's called 216 and 2016 and 17 budget highlights. Um, I'll kind of quickly go through that because we talked about this in our study session. The top priorities have been Compensation, as you can see, that's where 90% of our money goes in the M and L fund. And we have funded steps and lanes, and the estimated cost is 740,000. We have um, uh, agreed with our employee associations of a 2.25 percent base salary increase of 2,338,000, and our health insurance costs of a little over a million. So the compensation, the new compensation, is going to be about. Uh, Four million one hundred fifty-nine thousand. Also, we have others that we have to do, and I put them there. The charter school replacement that is growing, so that will poke close to seven hundred, uh, over seven hundred thousand with that addition of ninety-five thousand seven hundred. They that is captured from our K twelve by the state and sent to charter schools, and a half counselor. And this is needed to keep up with our, with our, um, uh, with our counselor ratios for accreditations and those types of things. Uh, we're actually going to hire more than half a counselor because we've been having uh, extra money in, uh, in a categorical program, a grant program. It's a, it's a Medicaid out admin outreach program. And so that's going to help. And I think I think Laurie and Student Services, the Laurie, I mean, but, and now it is. Good. Regina. That would be helpful out there, that additional counselor. Don't want it? Yeah. Okay. No. Um, I anticipate growing by at least 200 students. Um, but this budget assumes zero growth. And if we have zero growth just with the increase of the WPU value, we'll net 2.8 million. Now, prior year ADM growth, that's the current year we're in right now, drives the next year. Our ADM has grown quite a bit, and we expect to net an additional 754,000 with that prior year ADM growth. And then the rise in assessed value of collections, uh, 656,000, and that helps balance that out. We expect to have at least six or 700,000 in um, uh, new uh, uh, collections with our, with our uh, rise in assessed value. Okay, so that rounds out the m and highlights. Capital outlay budget, um, on June 6, 2012, or June, June 26, 2012, seems like just yesterday, but it was four years ago, um, we, the voters approved $65 million general obligation bonds to be issued. Uh, those have all been issued, and we've also been able to gather money from various other sources to complete numerous projects. I think we have leveraged our money as good or better than any district I've ever seen in my career with that with that. Uh, uh, you can see the completed projects, Rocky Mountain Junior High Edition, North Park Elementary Replacement, Weber Innovation Center. Walkwest Junior High replacement, Wee West Weaver Elementary replacement, 
And currently under construction, and will be opening in August, is the Marmont Club Heights replacement. And then the North Dog Junior High remodel expansion will occur mid-year next year. So that's something we're really proud of. Our challenges, and I won't read through this, but the big challenge we have is we are missing out. One, we have very low levies, and we are missing out on state aid when it comes to capital levies. And it has been some time since we've had a truth and taxation hearing, and uh, uh, we are proposing a truth and taxation hearing. And that will probably be scheduled. We're working out timing with the county and with other entities. That will probably be scheduled in late August. Hopefully, it would be nice to have our September board meeting. Um, we are proposing to have a two and a half million dollar increase in uh, the certified tax rate that will have two two and a half million dollars. That is earmarked for uh, capital purposes. We anticipate with that two and a half million, we conservative on being conservative will will net about eight hundred thirty eight thousand um, uh, dollars in state aid. That will probably be higher, uh, but for right now, I'm putting in eight hundred thirty eight. Uh, we have needs in buses, as you can see, textbooks, and capital projects. And so that'll round that out. And um, as we get closer to the truth and taxation time board, we will let you know the dates. Um, after the tax notices go out in late July, our, our hearing has to be on those tax notices. And then we have, um, uh, we have to have a minimum of at least two ads in the paper advertising the, the hearing. And then we'll have a hearing, and the taxpayers will be invited to comment on the hearing. And uh, chances are significant that we'll have people show up. Um, this is a very moderate tax increase, and um, uh, much needed. And the needs are crystal clear. I don't anticipate a whole lot of uh, you know visceral opposition this tax increase because I think it's needed, and our public knows it's needed. Um, Okay, last sheet. Um, uh, it's titled Child Nutrition Budget. Um, I just give a history there of the child nutrition of um, uh, school lunch prices. Our child nutrition, at one time, I was really nervous about it because our balances in the child nutrition were really plummeted, plummeting to precariously low by my position. But then, during the recession, oddly enough, they rebounded. The reason why they rebounded and went up significantly is because more and more individuals and families qualified for free and reduced lunch. And we get a significant federal infusion with free lunches. And so we've been doing pretty good um, uh, despite um, uh, challenges with the child nutrition on uh, uh, nutrition and calories and those kind of things. And uh, hats off to our child nutrition department. It's been, it's been doing well. And we have to increase lunch prices to maintain a federally mandated difference between what we get for free lunches and what the paid lunches are. And, uh, and so after five years, we are proposing a 10 cents increase in elementary to $1.85 on the lunch. And on junior high, after five, six years, we are going to go from two and a quarter to $2.30 a day. And so those uh, have to be approved so that we can then get news and word out to the parents. That's the highlight of the child nutrition budget. Finally, tax rates. We've discussed taxes uh, enough, but this was revised at 1 o'clock this afternoon. I got an alert from the, I've been checking it every day, and our certified rates have come in. The state basic levy has not come in yet, but our assessed value has gone up by 8.8%, if you can see on fiscal year 17, for the first time in the history of Weaver School District, our total value is over 8 billion, and it went over quite a bit to 8 billion 633 million, and that is really good news. Uh, uh, it, it shows our economy is healthy and growing, and uh, and so the assessed value, when it rises, the rates drop, the, the certified rates, and so you'll see a, a drop in the rate, and when we get our state basic rate there, that drop will be even more because that's the overall rate. Um, right now, to raise two and a half million dollars on the average home, the average home, the county just told me this afternoon, 
is $223,788. That's the average home in Weaver School District. Um, uh, is the, to raise two and a half million, it would cost $35.69 a year. That's the annual amount. So less than three bucks a month. And that is the figure that will go on the advertisement that hits the newspaper. Is, is that figure. But it will be finalized as we get closer. Um, you can see it's much needed. Our district is way behind in rate. Of the 15 Wasatch Front districts, we are 14th. Um, uh, and, so, and so that's one of the reasons why we're not getting state aid in programs like capital outlay, because we don't have a, a big enough effort. And yet we do have significant needs. And so board, we will be proposing a truth and taxation hearing, and, uh, and that will be, uh, we'll propose that to be at the end of August, first part of September. Um, now, Dean, that's my presentation. I kind of went through that quick. One of the reasons why I did is because we've been discussing these same figures and concepts and numbers now for several months, and we also reviewed it in a study session we had in November, and, and also a study session we had uh, earlier uh, in the spring, and then and then the study session today. Um, the, uh, the important motions we need right now is we need a motion to approve the 15-16 budget. This year, 15, 16, because this is our last time to do that, and uh, and if we don't do that, we we'll get a huge audit finding. We don't want a huge audit finding, and then and then we also then will approve the preliminary, the first draft of a 16, 17 budget. Right? This year, 16, 17. So two motions need to be made, and that's all I have to say. Any questions? Don't we have the budget hearing prior to the approval of the initial? 1617 budget. Yeah, we'll have the, the uh, we do have a hearing. Okay. Yeah. So if you like my comment. This is my presentation. Right. That's right. So we're going to do, yes. we'll ask the board for one motion at this point to the board of 1516. Then you'll open up for a hearing. If there's any public comment, you can take it. If not, then you can move into approval of 1617. That's correct, Superintendent.
we would ask that you keep your comments less than three minutes. Is there anyone uh, from the public that would like to speak to the proposed budget? If so, please come forward and sign in with Claire. And you have three minutes. I don't see anyone. We will now close our public hearing. Uh, um, we need initial approval of the 2016 budget uh, of the 2016-17 budget. Um, do I have a motion? to approve the initial 2016-17 budget. Betsy, is there a second? Janice, a second? Is there any discussion? Those in favor, please vote. Opposed? Okay. The motion passes. I need a motion to conclude this meeting. Rick? Seconded by Dan. Those in favor? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you for coming. <laughs>